want to thank everybody for, for joining today. Um, my name is Mark Godsey, and I'm the director of the Ohio Innocence Project, and I'm in the um, co-chair of the International Committee of the Innocence Network. And um, so this is going to be an event over three days. We have the first panel this morning, and then there's a panel tomorrow at 10 a.m., and then one at 9 a.m. These are Eastern Time, United States, on Friday. And um, I want to start off by thanking uh, the U.S. Asia Law Institute at NYU Law and um, the Duke International Human Rights Clinic at Duke Law for you know joining this cause and making this conference possible. This is um, an effort that's been going on for a number of years from various leaders in the Innocence Network. Um, the the Innocence Movement, I guess you could say, began in the U.S., but in the last decade or 15 years or so, there's been an increased interest. Um, around the world, and there have been innocence projects that have sprung up in every continent. There is now an entire network of innocence projects in Latin America called Red Innocente. Um, there's an innocence network in Europe. There's one in Asia. There are people doing this work in Africa. Um, and so there's been a, a real international community has been created. And one of the things we've all realized as this has gone global and we've engaged in discussions and, and talked about how we take this to the next step, is that there's a real gap in international law um, and that the United Nations has not spoken on this issue and it's something that could be very helpful um, in many different parts of the world in moving this cause forward. So the, the panel today is gonna to be talking about the, this innocence gap in international law and the moderator is Luca Laparia. Um, he is a full professor of criminal procedure at the University of Milan in Italy, and he serves as director of the Italy Innocence Project and president of the European Innocence Network. Um, he's written on uh, various topics of, of criminal law and criminal procedure in Italy, is a very well-known and respected uh, professor there, and he is um, a visiting professor at multiple American and universities, American and European universities. Um, he's also as is many of these professors who are um, active innocence lawyers um, admitted to the Italian Supreme Court and has done and continues to do ongoing legal work, um, criminal justice issues in Italy. So um, thank you everybody for joining. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Luca. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Mark. Good morning to all and welcome to this important meeting. Uh, um, this is the first panel and we are going to discuss about international law's innocence gap. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, the second panel will be held and uh, it will be about uh, strategies from uh, other new rights uh, campaigns. Then on Friday, the third and final panel will deal with a case study, the human rights to clean uh, environment. Due to the crucial importance of the whole meeting uh, in its complex uh, and the high standard of the speakers, I strongly uh, encourage you to attend all the panel, uh, on the panels I mentioned. Coming back to our panel that uh, I have the honor to moderate, uh, before giving uh, the, the stage uh, to my eminent colleagues, uh, I mean, let me shortly introduce myself, my Mark, uh, said very uh, very well my my profile uh, it's important to underline that uh, i currently serve as president uh, uh, the of the european innocence network uh, and uh, i am a director of the italy innocence project uh, the european innocence network uh, is uh, has been created uh, created um, with the fundamental uh, help by uh, Mark uh, Godsey. So we are here with uh, three speakers, each of uh, whom uh, will speak uh, for about uh, 15 minutes, uh, to be then followed by questions and answers. You can simply raise your hand and I will call on you so that you can interact uh, directly with, uh, with the speakers. The topic of uh, this panel uh, is uh, crucial, in my opinion, for different reasons. Uh, whoever happens to deal in uh, his professional life with wrongful conviction, a certain point becomes uh, fully aware of uh, fundamental circumstances. No matter how many technical and legal differences might exist between different legal systems, no matter how peculiar a national judicial system uh, uh, might be, 
rough conviction have a, a global nature and this phenomenon presents very similar issues and factors that are truly common in every part of the world. I'm thinking, of course, about the contributing factors that are able to lead to wrongful conviction. Uh, false confession uh, can happen in Italy as well in the United States, uh, as well in, uh, in Taiwan. Witnesses are able to incur in uh, uh, high witness misidentification in every country around the globe. Despite these undisputable similarities, International law up to date has struggled to recognize the phenomenon and to foresee supranational legal instruments. This is why it is important to have today the three speakers I'm going to introduce to you uh, now. Uh, the first uh, who will take the stage is my good friend and colleague, Brandon Garrett. Brandon is professor of law at the Duke University School of Law, where he directs uh, uh, the Wilson Center of uh, Science and Justice. I think uh, we can all agree that he's uh, a giant in the field of criminal procedure, wrongful conviction, scientific evidence, civil rights, corporate crimes, and so on. He's well known all uh, over the world uh, and uh, his, word, his works, uh, his uh, articles uh, are cited by courts, including the US Supreme Court also abroad. Brandon is going to discuss the practical problems that wrongful conviction has exposed and the national level change around the world in response. So uh, thank you, Brandon, uh, the stage uh, is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Luca, it's so wonderful to to gather with you all and we hope to gather in person one of these days to talk about this but given the multiple time zones in, involved it really is nice to to be able to connect online in this way um i i first started to think about this problem um when i was you know learning more and more from some of the projects around the world that, that uh, mark godsey was describing that had not just uh, successfully exonerated clients, and now you know in every continent we have innocence projects that have successfully uh, proven innocence, exonerated people um, in, in very different legal systems using very different tools. Uh, but, but what we've also started to see is that these wrongful convictions have exposed traditional rules of finality, which were often quite similar around the world rules which tended to say that if one has new evidence of innocence after one's conviction is final, after the appeal is done or any post-conviction procedure is finished, then the case is finished. Um, you know, in the United States, there were often rules that to reopen a case to consider new evidence of innocence uh, was forbidden after two years or three years. Uh, there was an infamously um, demanding rule in Virginia, where I taught for some number of years, where they had a 30-day rule. 30 days after the conviction, it was too late to bring in new evidence to supplement the record. Um, and that said, many countries, both civil and uh, common law countries, had exceptions, um, approaches that would permit a, a sort of a, an exceptional new appeal, um, a, a mechanism to bring in new evidence of innocence. Sometimes if there is a constitutional or human rights concern, then exceptions were recognized to consider in the interest of justice, new evidence of innocence. Um, in other contexts, though, there really was no vehicle available in court. And so we would see pardons, executive clemency, or entirely new approaches, like in countries that created um, innocence commissions or criminal case review commissions to create a new mechanism to reopen old cases. In general, though, particularly with the advent of DNA testing in the late 1980s, uh, you know, there, were, there were reasons why uh, traditionally courts were reluctant to reopen old convictions. The thought was that you know, witnesses' memories fade in days, if not months. Uh, the motivations of witnesses change over time. If you conduct a new trial five, 10, 20 years later, Witnesses may be deceased, police officers may have retired, people's memories will no longer be reliable. The thought was a new trial will be much less reliable than what happened at the time of the original trial. Uh, the evidence would basically degrade, people's memories fade, 
physical evidence may degrade. The, the fundamental model was changed where DNA testing could be done 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later. And the test results could be much more reliable than the memories of witnesses at the original trial. If the evidence was preserved under you know, dry conditions, that DNA test could tell you a lot more about who committed the crime and then, then perhaps the eyewitness could. Um, and so that introduced, a, you know, upset traditional notions of finality and court started to realize that, well, you know, there are other types of evidence that might be much more reliable years later than at the time of the original trial as well. And so what we started to see was in countries around the world, in reaction to exonerations, lawmakers, courts, all started to reconsider these traditional rules of finality. And what I thought was particularly fascinating was that we saw this happen in countries with very different legal systems, all converging on this common problem that traditional rules of finality really didn't provide a good vehicle for raising new evidence of innocence. Um, and so we have, you know, and, and it was often in, in, in response to high profile wrongful convictions that countries would adopt these legal reforms. And so we saw France changing its uh, procedures for revision. Um, both in 1989 and 2014 in response to high profile wrongful convictions. We have in the United Kingdom lawmakers adopting appellate reforms in response to the Birmingham Six and Guilford Four um, to, uh, to introduce a standard for unsafe convictions uh, and to have a more flexible standard for bringing in new evidence of innocence. Um, we had uh, many states in the United States passing new statutes allowing people to uh, obtain post-conviction access to DNA testing. We have two different revisions to the statutes in Taiwan in response to high profile DNA exonerations. Um, we had the uh, emerging approach to Canada where wrongful conviction investigations can be submitted to a minister of justice to investigate, but now there's a new push to create uh, an administrative agency, a criminal case review commission like was created in the United Kingdom. Um, there was the approach in the Netherlands to, in 2012 to permit new facts to be submitted to an attorney general to investigate. Um, and what I guess surprised me that given the, the diversity of national level changes in response to wrongful convictions uh, to develop more, more practically sort of useful, more meaningful remedies when new evidence of innocence inevitably does surface after a criminal conviction was that international law had, had very little influence on, on these changes. Um, and that many countries seem to be converging on the adoption of far more substantial remedies for wrongful convictions. Um, but that international human rights law seemed to have very little to say about this. And, that, and that, that was a topic that I began to collaborate with my wonderful colleagues, Larry Helfer and Jane Huckerby in an article that we, we titled Closing International Law's Innocence Gap. Um, and, you know, I, I had early on observed that it didn't seem like, it just seemed like a puzzle to me that international human rights law recognizes fair trial rights, a right to an appeal, right to a remedy, a number of rights that touch on key protections that are important in criminal cases. But it seemed like it, it, those, those international human rights provisions were drafted at a time when there was just limited awareness of wrongful convictions. And it, it, I thought it may, maybe had just been an oversight that this was sort of uh, before the era of DNA exonerations, before there was an international network of innocence projects, before some of the wrongful conviction scandals at different time periods in countries, you know, ranging from um, you know, People's Republic of China to Taiwan to France to the UK, to Canada. Um, we have countries around the world that have been rocked by high profile cases that have been reversed due to new evidence of innocence. But these international human rights provisions predated uh, the, the modern awareness that wrongful convictions can happen even in the most serious criminal cases. Um, and so I wanted to turn things over to, to Larry and then Jane to talk about our exploration of this gap. But then uh, some of our initial thinking about the need to bring together groups like this to talk about strategies where recognizing a new international human right takes hard work and thinking. And you know, one of our goals at this conference is to learn lessons from other efforts to recognize international human rights, what can go right and what can go wrong when one is trying to 
address a, a gap like the one that we feel is an important one to fill in this context regarding new, newly discovered evidence of innocence. So maybe I, I should stop there and, and turn things over to, to Larry and then Jane. Your presentations be very interesting. Uh, I don't know if there is uh, some uh, uh, question uh, for Brandon. You could do it at the end, Luca, also. At the end, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, uh, so we, um, we, we, I would give the word to Professor Lawrence Helfer, a professor of law and co-director of the of the Center for International Comparative Law at Duke University. Um, my understanding is that Professor Elfer has a privileged view also on European legal system since uh, he's a permanent visiting professor at the, at the Center of International Courts at the University of uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, which awarded him uh, with an uh, honorary doctorate. Professor Elfer has been recently elected uh, as a member of the UN uh, Human Rights Committee for 2023 and 2026. Uh, Professor Elfer, uh, Elfer is going to speak today about a crucial topic, in my opinion, why existing international human rights regarding appeal, remedies, compensation, uh, only touch on the problem with the wrongful conviction, but still leave an important gap at the supranational level. Please, uh, dear colleague, Professor Elfer, the audience is, uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and thank you for the, the organizers. This has been uh, an intellectual journey uh, from the start. Uh, it was a dinner conversation uh, between Brandon and Jane and myself when we first realized that there was something uh, really worth exploring in uh, this space where we have a tremendous number of important and impactful developments at the national level, which Brandon has described and many of the participants in this uh, conference have been involved in and contributed to. But uh, uh, the it's equally striking that uh, in the at the international level, the rights uh, of defendants to assert post-conviction claims of innocence are really insufficiently protected. And uh, so one of the things that the three of us tried to figure out and uh, is, is why that is the case and uh, why we have what we call in our paper, uh, International Law's Innocence Gap, and how uh, one might go about closing the innocence gap. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what the gap is and uh, what its kind of components are and why there are at least some efforts underway to attempt to close that, but they're not sufficiently developed. And I think one of the purposes of this conference is to really start thinking about how new rights uh, in general are recognized, what the value of, of uh, new rights at the international level might be. I'll say a few words about that at the end uh, before turning things over to Jane to discuss some of the different modalities uh, for recognizing such a right, which is one of the topics we spent a lot of time in, on the paper. And uh, that will, I think, set up the stage for uh, uh, discussion today and the remaining two days of the conference. So uh, the when I uh, try to conceptualize or talk through with colleagues the fact that there is no internationally recognized right to, to claim innocence, um, uh, it's kind of anomalous because quite a few human rights treaties at the global and the regional level recognize a range of extensive uh, fair trial rights and appeal rights, but we do not have uh, any treaty in its text interpretation or implementation that fully and explicitly recognizes the right to a sort of claim of a factual innocence after a conviction. And in many ways, we see this gap as uh, increasingly anomalous given how foundational innocence protection is at the national level, increasingly in different legal systems. Uh, and then also in light of international human rights laws, longstanding commitment to the presumption of innocence and to various criminal 
process and procedure guarantees. Indeed, uh, it's fair to note that human rights treaties are, are incredibly specific in detail in terms of those uh, rights, the presumption of innocence, the right to a fair trial, the right to appeal. And indeed, there is an extensive jurisprudence by regional human rights courts uh, and UN treaty bodies uh, and national courts that have developed the contours of this right, uh, both within international law and, of course, as it is protected at the national level. And there have been some interesting synergies between the international, regional, and national level in those regard, in, in that regard. Yet, um, and, and these really do provide a, a baseline of protection that I have these international pr protections that I that have influenced uh, a variety of legal systems around the world. Yet features that are central or would be central to meaningful review of, of post-conviction innocence claims at the national level are strikingly absent from existing international uh, rights guarantees. So for example, the just the bare obligation of governments to establish some mechanism for defendants to introduce fresh evidence of innocence on direct appeal or after a conviction is final, uh, that does not exist explicitly uh, in international law. And in our paper, we go through a number of different national models uh, that Brandon has touched on some of them, and uh, we think those should inform the international right. So even the obligation to establish that mechanism is, is lacking. Um, what about the evidentiary standards that would be applicable in such a proceeding? Well, that too is largely underspecified and might vary depending on whether we're talking about a judicial mechanism, uh, some sort of uh, administrative body, uh, some other kind of uh, fact-finding uh, mechanism within, say, the ex executive branch of government, all that is missing. Uh, as are, thirdly, the provision of an obligation to provide adequate remedies to individuals whose innocence claims are upheld, be that release, uh, or compensation or some other mechanism. Now, I will say that there are in a number of human rights treaties, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and a protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights, a right to compensation for miscarriages of justice. But this is a provision that was added on quite late in the process. It was quite controversial and its meaning is quite obscure. And it's worth noting that this right to compensation uh, is separate and freestanding from the lack of a, uh, an obligation on states to create a mechanism that would allow individuals who have been convicted to challenge their convictions and, and sentences. Now, having talked about this gap, and before I turn things over to Jane to talk about um, how the innocence gap might be closed, I want to say, uh, make two additional points. Uh, the first is that there is some uh, uh, evidence that the gap is already becoming noticed at the international level. Uh, it's not yet fully, uh, I think, recognized, but uh, in uh, the a recent, fairly recent general comment of the Human Rights Committee, which is the interpretive body for the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there was a recognition uh, of an explicit link for the first time between wrongful convictions post-conviction review and the right to life. And what the committee said in its uh, general comment, which is an interpretive statement on the right to life, it, the committee said that states must take all feasible measures to avoid wrongful convictions in death penalty cases, to review procedural barriers to reconsideration of those convictions, and, and here's the most important point, to re-examine past convictions on the basis of new evidence, including new DNA evidence. And this statement, uh, although not formally binding, it is an interpretation of the right to life, uh, is noteworthy for moving beyond the procedural guarantees that um, uh, might exist to support claims of legal innocence. So if there was some sort of defect at trial in terms of the process that was followed. Um, so there is uh, a, a strong foundation for this right, and there are a number of modalities for how it might be recognized. Um, but before turning things over to Jane, I just want to say um, 
a bit about why uh, the we might see advantages to recognizing uh, the right to claim innocence in international law. And I think it's worth noting, asking that question because uh, we do have developments at the national level that have been quite impactful, albeit they do vary from region to region and, and country to country. But it, at the international uh, level of recognition, there can be symbolic benefits, strategic benefits, normative benefits, and enforcement benefits to recognizing a new right. Uh, the, the recognition of a right can uh, serve as a kind of catalyst uh, for advocacy. It can reframe claims for uh, that would otherwise be based on discretion or mercy of the government into normative entitlements that have a firmer foundation in the law. Uh, they can link to states' existing obligations under international law to take various steps relating to the criminal legal process. And they can also provide uh, potential opportunities for enforcement. Those might be directly before some of the courts, tribunals, and treaty bodies that I mentioned, but they can also be indirect in the sense that national judges in many countries will often pay attention to the normative developments that are occurring at the international level uh, when they decide whether to recognize a right uh, to post-conviction relief and what its contours might be. So we think there's an enormous amount of work to be done in the practical implementation of this right. But uh, in order to understand how that might be done, we first need to understand the different modalities by which the right could be recognized. And I can think of no one better than my colleague, Jane Huckerby, to talk about those issues and set the stage for our further discussion. So I will uh, stop my remarks there. Thank you, Lawrence, for this uh, intonation, uh, in very interesting uh, speech. Uh, how important uh, this right to claim innocent after a conviction would be for all these countries, including in Europe, uh, that do not have uh, review uh, institutions uh, for a uh, wrongful conviction or provide exercise, excessive filters on appeal. Um, so very, very interesting. And now is the turn of our uh, last speaker for the day, Professor Jane Hackerby, who is a clinical professor of law and the uh, inaugural director of International uh, Human Rights Clinic at Duke University School of Law. Uh, she frequently serves uh, as a human rights law expert uh, to international and regional governmental uh, uh, organizations and uh, NGOs, uh, particularly on uh, gender, human rights, and national security, and the nexus between uh, trafficking and terrorism. Professor Hackerby is going to explain to us different possible strategies for right, uh, rights recognition, including lessons to be learned from other rights recognition and efforts. So uh, I let her start uh, right, now, uh, right now, and thanks, uh, Jenny, for your intervention. Well, uh, thank you, Luca, and thank you to Brandon and, and Larry for really setting up you know, both the striking absence of the influence of international law um, on national developments in this space, but also um, the ways in which um, there are huge benefits um, to having international um, weight of a, of a new right to claim innocence um, in ways that can really um, exactly enhance the symbolic, expressive, strategic, normative enforcement um, capacity um, of a, a right to claim innocence. And so, my comments are going to focus on, on two areas, and they really are meant to be sort of a preview of what will be a much more detailed conversation um, in our panels over the next two days. So I will keep them quite brief, but look forward to um, engagement on this with um, our audience. But my two areas of comments are, first of all, to sort of fit the right to claim innocence into the different typologies that we have for recognizing new human rights under international human rights law. Um, and again, the backdrop here is to understand that you know, adding a, a new protection to the canon of international human rights law is not something that's taken lightly um, for a variety of reasons. And so 
to tease out the sort of the two core pathways to recognition. And then secondly, maybe give a bit more detail about what some of the pushback um, can be on adding or recognizing a, a new human right. Um, again, with a sense of thinking through some of the strategic um, and normative questions that accompany um, arguing for a new human right to claim innocence. Um, so on that first question of, you know, how do we, it's a you know, very practical matter, um, recognize a new international human rights under international law. Um, so essentially there are a two, two pathways um, that we think of um, for recognition the derivative rights pathway and the standalone. And let me talk through those because they're quite different um, in terms of what is required um, from the international community to make a claim under either pathway. So the derivative pathway, um, as the name would suggest, um, is when you newly imply or derive a right from a set of existing and understood and well-defined human rights guarantees. And so the idea is here that we work with the fully existing norms that we have under international human rights law, but we read them differently and we read them differently um, in light of changed circumstances. We read them often more expansively um, to encompass new types of rights violations. Um, but this pathway of, of derivative rights um, is in many ways a, a pathway um, that is a safer, uh, easier pathway than trying to recognize a right to claim innocence as a standalone right. And the reason why it's easier and it's safer, and I put those in, in comments, it's not, it's not a fully easy or safe um, path to, to pursue. But the idea is that you're working with an existing set of what we sometimes call parent rights, um, so the existing overarching rights, and we just help states understand how they can be expansively or differently applied. So you're not trying to um, set up a new framework that states need to, act, to agree to. You're merely working with your existing norms and interpreting them in an expansive way. So for example, as um, Larry foreshadowed, um, there is, a, you know, and, and went through with us, um, there is some strong jurisprudence um, in the human rights tribunals that provide a basis um, for a derivative approach to seeing a right to claim innocence, so for deriving um, a new right to claim innocence. So for example, um, we can sort of get there via um, rights to life, uh, to a right um, to fair trial and appeal, right to remedy and to compensation for miscarriages of justice. So a derivative pathway um, is a path that can be pursued. Um, we'll hear in the next two days about, you know, sort of the crossroads that different rights movements, you know, have been on um, in figuring out what to do in terms of pursuing that derivative pathway or, or a harder path as a standalone rights recognition. Um, and sometimes in practice, movements pursue both. Um, and I'll talk more about why, why they do that momentarily. Um, but just to kind of go through the mechanics piece. So that's the derivative right taking an existing set of rights that the state is bound by and reading them to get to the right protection that we want to get to. Um, and that is also a little bit easier in the space too, because exactly as Brandon and Mark both laid out, um, the national recognition of the right to claim innocence is ahead of the international law recognition. So getting states on board with something they're doing already domestically um, is going to be less of a, um, a fight, right? And um, so that's definitely the, was the case, for example, with the recent recognition of the right to a clean and healthy environment, um, a huge um, component of the ways in which um, the multilateral system was able to and excited about developing um, that human right um, was because it was already existing in national law. So it wasn't going to be a new set of obligations on states. And so Again, um, Larry Helfer is chairing a panel out on Friday, but just to foreshadow, that's the derivative rights approach was very much used um, in the right to a um, new environment movement. Um, but the second pathway is about recognizing a separate freestanding standalone right. And it's more difficult um, as both a conceptual and a practical matter. And again, the reasons why it's more difficult are not difficult to understand. Um, it does involve sort of creating a new normative um, framework for states to abide by. And states are always going to be resistant um, to the creation of a new standalone right that they think is sort of additional to their existing um, binding guarantees that they've committed to under international human rights law. So what we have, I mean, if we're trying to get into this new standalone freestanding right, we have a test, a quality control test that really balances these two imperatives, right? On the one hand, 
not overburdening states um, and imposing a whole bunch of new, like out of left field <laughs> human rights on them. But at the same time, the need to understand that human rights law is evolving. Um, we are, it is meant to respond to changing circumstances. We, as Brandon mentioned, we have a whole bunch of core nine international human rights treaties, but they're not fixed. Like we are meant to recognize that things change. And so to strike a balance between those two imperatives, don't overburden states, but also recognize that rights can change. We have this quality control test, which comprises roughly five requirements. And again, the requirements are a little bit different in different spaces, but the overarching requirements are five. Now, the first of which is that the new right must be um, consistent with existing rights. So it's consistency. So meaning it's not repetitive um, and it clarifies meaningful redress. So not, um, it must be consistent. Um, it must be fundamental. And again, that term is used differently across different instruments, but fundamental um, rights here um, implies um, that it is universal, that it is core, um, that it has a weight um, to the right and that it's very, very meaningful. Um, so consistent, fundamental. The third requirement is the new right um, must be precise. Um, and that's really important. Again, this is a real reflection of the needs of, of governments in this regard. Um, is that it must be sufficiently precise in identifying rights holders. So who's holding the right, as Larry talked through, the difference if you're a right holder compared to someone asking for a benefit, you're actually a rights holder. Um, precision in identifying uh, who is a rights holder and who is a duty bearer. And precision in the scope of the content of the right itself. And that is something that you'll, maybe you'll have a chance to reflect upon either now or in a later discussion. But something we, we really spent a lot of time on, particularly led by um, Brandon and Larry on this, and like really thinking through like, you know, what is the content of a new right to claim innocence? How do you think about it being sufficiently precise um, so that it is consistent, um, but also that it does map out for states' parties and for in, impact individuals, how they can um, enforce the right? So the requirements so far are uh, consistent, fundamental, precise, enforceable. So again, um, reflecting Larry's point, um, a key reason why we think about rights benefits and why you can go to the human rights framework um, is to enhance our enforceability regime. Um, and so this means enforceability in the domestic space, but also um, through regional and international mechanisms. And so again, the precision and the enforceability re requirement here tend to go hand in hand um, because part of the enforceability um, is linked to the clarity around understanding who is a rights holder, who is a duty bearer, and what the right you're talking about actually means. And the final um, element um, is the right enjoy broad international support. And again, you can see where that criteria comes from. Um, the idea is meant to be here that we don't um, sort of impose a right um, on the international community that um, is only um, supported by a slim um, contingent of, of that community. Um, and again, here we're really aided by the fact that the um, rights to claim innocence are so much more articulated at the national level um, than the um, international level. So derivative pathway, use existing rights to read the right, standalone pathway, meet this five point quality control um, test. Um, we argue that um, a, a couple of things. We argue that it's possible to get to the right to claim innocence via both pathways. Um, and we apply the different tests that are involved in that. Um, but we also like really think about and something that I'm looking forward to our conversation both today, but the next two days too, like, well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of going each way? Like, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you gain if you go derivative rights? What do you lose? What do you gain if you go standalone? What do you lose? And we talk about these questions of, you know, the strategic questions around driving the right versus seeing it as freestanding. Um, by thinking about things such as feasibility, like how easy, how easy is it to do it? So again, it's going to be easier to do a derivative rights approach. Um, but then the protection question becomes really important here. So even if it's easier to go a derived rights approach, does it provide the protective mechanisms that we would want um, for a full right to claim innocence? And as Larry pointed out very clearly, there are gaps in the current international human rights law framework that don't quite get us to resolving um, some of the normative gaps in international human rights law. And so we'd argue here that would be an argument for a standalone um, requirement. Um, another um, question that we talk about is, and I think this is particularly relevant for the transnational innocence movement in a way that's also very relevant for the right to environment, which is also a transnational um, movement, 
Um, is there something very important? There's something about in a standalone right that really recognizes um, the extraordinary sort of social movements um, and the uniqueness of these social movements um, in se securing these rights in the domestic spaces that can be really relevant here to, um, to emphasize the gravity of the right um, at stake. That all being said, um, we also, and so my final comments um, and this closing up um, now on this, are thinking through like, well, where do states object um, to questions of developing new human rights? And not just states, frankly, as well, but some like progressive rights advocates um, as well. There can be a, a little bit of a, a wariness around thinking through when you expand uh, the human rights corpus. And I want to give a couple of heads up around the debates that can have the pushback that can happen in this space. Um, you can definitely get um, concerns that when you add more to the human rights framework, you delegitimize existing guarantees, right? There's something about the idea that if you constantly expand human rights, that you are weakening um, the corpus. There's also questions around do we generate ambiguity in the normative content of right? Um, part of the appeal of the human rights framework is it's sufficiently clear normatively, but also enables um, states to develop to make more particularized um, state practice. But if we keep adding rights, you know, is there fuzziness around normative content? That was a big issue on the right to environment. So I think that'll be something that Larry will get into um, with, um, with his colleagues um, on Friday. Um, another question is something that I think we have our colleague, we do have a colleague, um, Inga Winkler here, who is an expert on um, how to expand, how to recognize the right to water um, under international human rights law, which is not explicitly guaranteed um, in the international human rights instruments. And here you can get sort of this pushback in those kind of areas, you know, around, it tends to be more with the concentration on cultural rights, but I think it's important to think through in this regard too, um, is the idea that you're undermining core human rights. Um, you know, the idea that you're going against sort of civil political rights guarantees. I think that's going to be less of a, a pushback here because the transnational innocence movement has anchored so much of the analysis in this very classic, you know, rule of law, um, right to process, et cetera, argumentation. But there can be a bit of a pushback um, on this idea that we've got the core rights already guaranteed. If you add more, you're diluting the human rights framework. Um, and a couple of more things you, you will get, just anticipate um, in advance. Um, there's a, a worry about overloading the international and regional supervisory machinery. Again, the idea when you bring in more rights, that you add more to the plate of adjudicatory, adjudicatory bodies, like in those spaces. Um, one thing that I don't think we'll, you will get in this space, but just to kind of flag it, it definitely happens in many other new rights contexts, particularly rights around gender and rights around LGBTI rights, um, is the idea that new rights claims can mask very complex political questions um, in ways that circumvent um, legitimate domestic political debate. Again, I think the fact here that the right to claim innocence has been so much more recognised in the international space and the international law is lagging might... Um, some degree of mute that critique, but it's important to recall that that is um, often a really big pushback here. That essentially you're usurping domestic governance um, space. Um, I have more to say, but I think it's important, maybe important to stop at this point and um, engage in, in Q and A, like on the space, and I'm looking forward to our ongoing conversation. Thank you, Professor uh, Hackerby, for uh, your uh, your speech. Uh, uh, I must say that your speech is nothing but an excellent starting point from which we can all uh, uh, start reasoning in view of the upcoming uh, panel uh, in, uh, panels in the next uh, uh, two days. Uh, I don't know if Mark wants to intervene. Otherwise, I would like to open the debate by asking for the floor. You can ask uh, your questions directly to the, to the three speakers or... If you want, you can uh, write uh, in uh, in the chat. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate <laughs> to ask. Hello, uh, there is Mark. Mark, uh, it's, uh... yeah. Hello. I guess I I will go first. Um. So I mean, I I would imagine that the situation the innocence community in is similar to other groups where, like, take me for example. I am a domestic Ohio lawyer. I know how difficult it is to lobby the Ohio legislature for a, a new law, and but I've learned how to do that. Um, and when we began talking about this issue, it was very overwhelming to me, um, to the point where like I hired a consultant to even start and started reading books to like understand the jargon. Uh, 
um, and I don't want to intrude on things we're going to discuss in the next two days, but um, my ignorance of, of, of this uh, knows no bounds. So I, I, I like this is, I guess my question is more toward Jane. Uh, when you say the derivative, right, and then the standalone, right? Um, when you're talking about the derivative, right, like what is the actual process by which that is recognized? So, you know, when Roe versus Wade was decided, lawyers went to the US Supreme Court and said, we can find these derivative things from due process and, and you know, they pulled different things together to say there's a right to privacy. So who, who takes these derivative things and makes that decision? And then on the other hand, if you go to the standalone route, like again, I know what it's like to lobby the Ohio legislature, but what does that look like and how long does it take? And, and you know, those are some of my questions um, as I'm just, we're just starting this off. Uh, Jane? Sure, uh, maybe I begin and then Larry, do you wanna jump in? Does that make sense? I, I'll, I'll start and Mark also jump in if you have any questions I'm going through because it's more interesting to be like back and forth um, as we go through. So. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question um, and not capable of a short answer, but I will try and do the synoptic um, answer to it. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different sites by which we define the content of norms under international human rights law, many different, but let me keep them big picture. Um, we have the treaty monitoring bodies and these are bodies, and I said Larry Helfer is a member of the Human Rights Committee, which monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These are treaty monitoring bodies that are designed to monitor the implementation of each of the nine core international human rights treaties. Um, so for example, we have the Human Rights Committee monitoring the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, we have the Committee on the Rights of the Child monitoring um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you know, and so forth. So for every core human treaty, we have these treaty monitoring bodies. And they do a bunch of stuff. Let me just put out the whole thing and then I'll come back to each one. They do the treaty monitoring bodies. Then we have um, the Human Rights Council the UN Human Rights Council, which is an interstate body. And within that body, you have a whole bunch of different procedures. But let me highlight probably the most important um, for this purpose of defining rights guarantees, um, is you have um, a whole bunch of what we call independent mandates, um, both thematic and country-based mandates, that do work on this. And again, I'm going to explain how this all plays out in practice in, in one moment. But essentially, within the Human Rights Council, you have these independent, independent experts but the Human Rights Council itself can adopt resolutions, um, which are these sort of soft law instruments, which set out um, the content of new rights guarantees. So, and then we come back and map that on the right environment. So the Human Rights Council, independent experts, but the council itself votes on resolutions. And then you have human rights content developed through the UN General Assembly as well. Um, and again, there, the mechanism can be through soft law in, in terms of adoption resolutions and so forth. Okay, so treaty monitoring bodies, and there's way more than this, but let me just give you this the international system. Treaty monitoring bodies, UN Human Rights Council, both as itself and the independent experts within it, UN General Assembly. So what you do when you're trying to develop a new normative content, either derived or standalone, is I think through like where in that spectrum of different bodies, can you get traction on developing the normative content of a right? So for example, again, I know Inga, you should definitely jump in at some point if you'd like to, <laughs> you know, if you're looking at the um, right to water, like you go to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and you talk to them, you know, you engage with them around ways in which they can help develop that content, primarily via the modality of what are called general comments or general recommendations, which help explore the, the contours of a right. But let me talk about the right to a healthy environment a bit more because it might compromise it more. Okay. The right to healthy environment, one of the first key checks in that regard, and this could be something for, you, for everyone to think about, was to have a special rapporteur um, on the right to a healthy environment appointed. And his mandate, um, and we have the um, first person who held that mandate, John Knox, um, speaking on Friday with, with Larry, his mandate was to exactly establish under international law, is there a right to a, a healthy environment? Right? So he was established because you know, there was this concern in the international community around whether that this right existed. So they made a new thematic mandate. They appointed someone with that exact question. And he wrote an extraordinary report, which I know he'll talk more through on, on Friday, essentially going through and saying, here are the ways you can derive 
a right to a healthy environment from existing rights. So he went through and talked about, you know, the right to water, <laughs> and, you know, the right to life. Um, and said, like, here are all these ways in which we can get there. And he also said, I actually think too that you can get to a right to a healthy environment via a standalone right. And he applied that bio quality control test um, that I mentioned. Okay, so that's one way in that space. I think that might be a really good way to go forward here, potentially, like is to try and get a special rapporteur appointed like on, on this topic. Um, and then, and again, I'm, I'm short clicking so many things here that I'm doing such injustice to the, to the movement, but to give you an idea of the, of the highlights. Then um, the um, right to a healthy environment movement decided that they would target the Human Rights Council for a resolution establishing the right to a healthy environment. Right, so a resolution for everyone who's not, not it's not very obvious what that is if you're not in, in this space. It's like a two and a half page document, maybe like it's not long, um, but it's highly negotiated text um, in which you go through and say like, yes, there is a right to, you know, it's all this preambular stuff and then the operative um, stuff in the resolution. And that resolution was heavily debated between states. And there's one thing, Mark, you'll find will be, I think, one of the biggest challenges. I know that with a big challenge in the right to health environment space is not every state agreed, right, on what the right to health environment, like, should cover. And particularly the French had certain concerns um, about what that term should cover. So you'll have a lot of back and forth because the idea is you want to get every state to agree to that resolution, right? You'll have some countries that might abstain, some that might not, you know, say no, but you want to get the bulk on board. Um, and so that's, a, again, the progression here was how a special rapporteur set out how it's a derived and um, standalone right, get a resolution for the Human Rights Council, take a bit of a loss, you know, a bit of a hit on what you got in that resolution, which is kind of part of the danger when you're doing a multilateral compromise because it's going to be the lowest common denominator among states. Um, and then what that what that community did is go and get a general assembly resolution on the same topic. But that was helped by having the Human Rights Council resolution. They would never have got to general assembly first. That's a harder body to get traction on. So they sequenced it, right? Special rapporteur in the Human Rights Council, Human Rights Council resolution, establishing the right, saying it's derived from existing rights, and then a GA resolution on the same point. And so I understand that progression. And yeah. the first one is the special rapporteur's report. That doesn't have any binding effect. It's just no. a stepping stone. So, yeah. Then... Yeah. Thanks for clarifying, Mark. Actually, so the thing about any of this space, which can be, again, maybe very hard from the domestic space to understand, is that we don't really have anything that's um, fully binding under, into, not anything, but like Larry had a heart attack over in Copenhagen. Let <laughs> me saying that. That was me um, being, you know, playing the devil's advocate to the extreme. Um, but we don't have, um, we have a lot of soft law under international human rights law. So we have both soft law, what we call soft law and hard law. Okay, again, the hard law are the treaties um, and the things that we can actually sort of, that are binding on states, parties. And we have soft law mechanisms, which, you know, as the name would suggest, are not directly binding on states, but we, but we can do a lot of work in the soft law area. It's a bit harder to change the hard law, but you can do a lot of work in the soft law. I'm sorry, Larry, for again, giving you that little hard to take note on that. Um, but we do have um, a whole bunch of stuff that we, you know, develop normative content in that soft law space. Does that make sense, Mark? Yes. So, but states understand that, which is, and again, I think to be really clear, states don't just give you a, a, a go pass on developing a soft law norm. Like there will be like pushback on that. And again, Inga would know this way more from the right to water context, you know, as well. Um, the states know that what happens in the soft law space is really relevant for them, right? That it gives more of a claim. Like if you can, you know, go to your domestic court and say there's a human rights council resolution and GA resolution on this human right, um, you know, it, it changes the, the way in which you can engage with the domestic mechanisms. So that's one pathway. And then also you would also see behind the scenes. I didn't mention it, but a lot of work with the treaty monitoring bodies, you know, any time that an issue comes up that's relevant to your area, like making a submission to the treaty monitoring body on this to show how the right to claim is, is implicated in that as well. But I'm sorry, I've put a very long, a long time there, but Larry, do you want to jump in and add what I've missed? So, I'm, so you can see why having Jane as part of this project is so important because mm -hmm. yeah. she understands all the different modalities. Let me just jump to the 40 or 50,000 foot level mark and answer your question in a slightly different way, which is what you are really doing is creating um, a set of persuasive and 
presumptively legitimate interpretive templates, if you will, that civil society groups like the Innocence Networks can latch onto and use in their advocacy in a variety of ways. Now, within the United States, we have done an enormous amount to close off our legal system to most international influence. Happily, that is not, in, well, it's not entirely true, and it is certainly not true in most other countries of the world. And so I agree that if you were thinking about um, trying to persuade a legislator in Ohio that uh, I'm not sure it would make uh, any difference except perhaps a negative difference if you were to say, did you know that there is a, a recognized right to claim in innocence at the, at the international level? It might make a difference if you said, look, this treaty to which the United States is a party and which it reports on every year uh, supplements and reinforces the constitutional guarantees in uh, of the due process at the federal and state level. And this body, which has uh, experience looking at legal systems, including that of the United States, but also almost all other common law and civil law legal systems around the world, has come up with a set of recommendations regarding how to operationalize a principle that we hope you at least at the abstract level think is important, which is that, is that those who are factually innocent can be able to have some kind of remedy for convictions that are wrongful. So that's how I would phrase it in the United States. Um, within, uh, in other countries, I think you have much more ability to say, to actually show one of the documents that Jane has been describing, if it has gone through a process uh, of being generated through um, an authoritative pathway, and that's one of the things we're thinking about, what is the authoritative pathway, uh, that both at the, the governmental level, say executive branch or administrative, and at the judicial level, you can say, actually, this is how this right should be operationalized. And that can be really impactful. Now, I want to be very clear, these norms, because as Jane said, my small heart attack notwithstanding, they, whether they're hard or soft, they don't self-actualize. They become meaningful because civil society and um, rights advocates take them up and use them to be able to uh, make meaningful legal and policy change. But if they don't have the normative basis for that advocacy, their advocacy is going to be all other things equal less impactful. So what Jane is describing to you is what are the different pathways, both kind of theoretically, normatively, and very practically. And I kind of backfilling by saying, here's how uh, they might really make a difference. I'll stop there. Larry, if I just add to that exactly that last point, and Mark, this I think it also goes to your, your question about sort of use domestically. Um, there is a very significant bringing human rights home movement um, in the United States. Like we have a whole network, um, which explicitly is designed at figuring out like, exactly as Larry said, we have this really tricky situation that can vary across administrations, but it's overall, overall the same, which is US government has certain treaty obligations that it recognizes, but it has a whole bunch of um, things it doesn't recognize, including um, economic, social, and cultural rights, um, the rights of the child, and uh, women's rights. So these are these are core and also rights on and enforced appearances. These are treaties the US government refuses to be bound by uh, under international law. And so there has been a real push um, in the Bring Human Rights and Home movement to use resolutions, right? To use a Human Rights Council resolution for the right to water uh, in Alabama, for example. There's a whole movement like around that. Um, there is a movement to, particularly in the anti-racism movement um, in the United States, um, to use um, these different treaties and the soft law instruments uh, to hold the US to account. And so there is, again, just to kind of, there, there is a whole bunch of stuff in the United States now where the local grassroots um, are just much more deliberate about using human rights, soft law and hard law um, to get access to claims the US government would otherwise deny. 
Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Lawrence, for this picture uh, and, and this roadmap. Uh, I would like to, um, to give the floor to Professor Sapir from Tel Aviv for this Hello. question. Um, good evening, where I, where I, where I am. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I would like to firstly congratulate you all for uh, putting together this uh, wonderful an important uh, conference and panel, and to the members of the panel for such a precise uh, presentation. Um, I would like, uh, oh, firstly, let me just uh, briefly say that up until last year, I served as Israel Chief National Public Defender, um, doing a lot of innocence work there. We have a, a post-conviction, what we call a retrial department at the Public Defender's Office, and we're also, uh, uh, there also, since I'm not there anymore, a member of the Innocence Network and the European Innocence Network. Um, currently, I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University and still involved in innocence um, work. Um, so let me just point out uh, one document that uh, um, you may you may know about it or may not. It's the United Nations Principles and Guidelines on Access to Legal Aid in criminal justice system. And in this uh, document that was uh, um, actually upheld, it, it was drafted by the UNLBC, but it was also upheld by the General Assembly. Uh, hidden in this document in Article 55B, there is a language that relates to, to innocence, although not directly. And let me uh, just briefly read it. Uh, Article 55 says, in order to encourage the functioning of a nationwide legal aid system, states should, where it is appropriate, undertake measures. And among these measures, um, to provide legal aid to persons who have been unlawfully arrested or detained, or who have received a final judgment of the court as a result of a miscarriage of justice, in order to enforce their rights to retrial, reparation, including compensation, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-repetition. So uh, it speaks about miscarriage of justice and the right to retrial, but actually about the right to legal aid in such matters. And when we're thinking strategically, um, I think that one avenue could be to speak about legal aid for various reasons. First, there's already language about that. Um, and, 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 uh, but the other reasons are, um, the second reason may, may be that the prisoners um, are usually poor um, and, and, and legal aid is crucial. And the third um, strategic reason would be that legal aid providers could be um, advocates and facilitators of change um, in their litigation or in advocacy, depending, of course, of the, of the system. So this is just an idea that I'm putting on the table, um, and um, it, it may be useful for the effort. I understand that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that exactly reflects um, the, the, the article that you had read out like exactly reflects um, a derivative rights approach right? it's drawing upon right. like the right exactly. to recreation and, and so forth too so you really it's a really great example so of, of how it's anchored like in that um and it also has at the same time as, as Larry was speaking through um there's still there's still nominative gaps that result from that as you identified too right so it's like how do we sort of think about you know whether building out a more full derived rights approach or going a standalone approach, like which one's needed. But thank you for exemplifying exactly um, that piece. Uh, Lawrence, Brandon, uh, if you want to uh, add something. Otherwise, the, we have the a question from uh, Catherine Willem. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to uh, raise two questions actually, um, both coming out of Jane's presentation, but welcome anybody to comment on this. The first one was the, the quality control test mm -hmm. that Jane set out. One of the elements was the need for precision in identifying rights holders. And 
I could see where that would be uh, very challenging in this context, because when we talk about innocence and who exactly who in the amongst the various categories of people who would be claiming innocence of one kind or another, who would be eligible for this specific right, um, there I could see room for a lot of debate. Um, because there is actually, in, in, among some innocence organizations, there is some disagreement about who they will represent and whom they won't represent or assist. So I wanted to ask if there had been any preliminary analysis done on this point, how, how the rights holder would be defined in this case. And then the other question um, is that uh, Jane mentioned that there could, it could be possible, at least in theory, to uh, promote this right or get recognition of this right following both of the pathways that she laid out, both a derivative, derivative, derivatively and as a standalone right. But she suggested that a derivative approach might not be sufficiently protective and might leave some gaps. And I wondered if she could elaborate a bit or if somebody could elaborate a bit on what those gaps might be. Thank you. I wonder, um, Brandon, do you want to reflect on the rights holder question? Because we, we, we definitely had this exact conversation when we were talking about defining the normative content of the right itself. Um, Catherine, so you're totally presiding like what with an issue, like you know, in this regard of like thinking through like who was the category of persons um, to whom the state would owe the obligation. We had questions around should be someone who then subject to you know a legal um you know a change in a legal situation or a factual um change in, in their answer. So just Brad and maybe you can reflect or Larry more on that. Um, I think in general it could track some of the other criminal procedure rights where the concern is with people that the state has convicted. Um and so um this is you know of a piece with other criminal procedure rights, where the rights holder is someone who the state has has convicted and there still is a conviction uh, in place. Um, but the question, you know, how precisely, and, and, and the concern is that it would be defined too narrowly, um, new evidence of innocence is described. I think that's that that's a really the big one. And that that's not, I guess doesn't go to the rights holder, but it goes to how broad the right is. Um, and, and that said, like in the right to compensation context, there isn't a, a, you know, overly constrained and there's some flexibility for nations to define, like, what does it mean to be exonerated? So you have a right to compensation. Um, and so I, I think there are good models here for, um, you know, that there, there could be good differences of opinion in terms of, you know, are you a country that has like an unsafe conviction standard? Um, the concern would be that um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's human rights law should have something to say if a country defines innocence so narrowly uh, that it's almost impossible for any new evidence to be innocent. And so you really have new evidence that that quite significantly undermines the original uh, conviction. Um, but uh, but uh, under a you know, you have something arbitrary like an old finality regime which says, well, that new evidence doesn't count because it's been more than two years or that evidence doesn't count because it wasn't introduced at the original trial. Well, by definition, if it's new, it wasn't introduced at the original trial. Um, or that it's a forfeiture rule where we feel like you should have, you know, had the resources despite your lack of resources as a public defender to have uncovered that, in, that evidence at the time of the trial. And so it's too late now because you, it's your own fault for not having proven your own innocence earlier. Right? Those, those are all the kinds of considerations that, that come up and, and do come up practically when, when at the national level, there are debates about how to define these uh, post-conviction remedies. Uh, and I kind of think like with other international rights, there's going to be some, some understandable tension where we, we want countries to continue to innovate as they have, to rethink some of these traditional rules of finality and develop these post-conviction mechanisms. And there isn't going to be a one size fits all model innocent statute, um, but, um, but there really does need to be some international human rights pressure on countries, which really do still have rules that are that really don't give people a fair chance to to litigate innocence. So maybe I'll just add those are both, I think, helpful. And Catherine, the question is a good one. I, from my own perspective, I don't view the 
the specificity or this, this kind of requirement that we're discussing as being preclusive. I think in part, it depends on what the pathway is for coming to uh, the developing the contours of the right. So as we can talk about with respect to other rights that have been accepted within the UN political process or the UN expert uh, human rights expert process, part of what is often done is a canvassing at the national level of where the right is recognized and not, and in what ways is it recognized for those countries that do recognize it. Um, and that in part helps to determine whether there are common models or templates that can uh, be used uh, by different countries. And so one of the things we try to do, we do in the paper is we start out by saying there actually are a number of different national models. And one question that we would want to debate if this were to go forward is, um, are all of those models equally consistent with uh, the core elements of whatever the right to, to claim innocence uh, is determined to be? I think our own preliminary view was that they both, they all at least had presumptively the potential to, to serve the, uh, as realization of the right. But they, the way in which, and if that's true, the way in which the details might be worked out and the, the specificity would be provided might be different for each of those models. So if you're talking about uh, more of a judicial model, uh, then there are questions, as Brandon was alluding to, about uh, finality and who, who is the gatekeeper on getting around finality. If you're talking about a fact-finding body at the administrative level, then of course the rules on finality can be somewhat different uh, in the sense that the administrative body might be able to entertain a claim and make some sort of preliminary determination about whether this ought to be heard by judges to reopen a conviction. So I, I think it exactly is correct to say that you can meet specificity requirements as in the quality control standards or guidelines, without having one size fits all. I don't have much to add to, sorry, Catherine, to, I know you've asked another question, so um, to um, Brandon and Lara's explanation, except to say like, when we were thinking about protection gaps, um, what really came up was the finality um, piece at different sort of stances on finality, because um, there's inconsistent state practice on this and the international human rights law doesn't provide detailed guidance on, on this. And so that was one area where we'd actually have international law be more of a leader, like two states parties, like on that. Um, that was one of the core areas, as you saw from the comments of both Brandon and Larry, that was one of the big ones that we were thinking um, through in that regard. I'm, I'm interested, nobody said anything about guilty pleas or people who have taken a plea bargain. So do you do none of you think that that is challenging? Because I could imagine states saying, well, fine, if somebody went to trial, and, and you know, were found guilty at trial and there was an error at trial, no problem, we're happy to entertain that. But somebody took a plea. Um, I could imagine pushback on that. Is that of any concern or you think that can be overcome easily? It's a right, concern. Maybe. I mean, it's been a common theme in the US that many states have rules that, uh, that you can waive post, a whole range of post-conviction rights, including um, uh, rights to present new evidence of innocence if you plead guilty. And sometimes the terms of the plea say that, and, and sometimes uh, statutory remedies in the United States say that if you have pleaded guilty, you don't have the ability to seek a writ of innocence or whatever the procedure is called. Um, particularly now that forms of plea bargaining are spreading all around the world in very different systems. Um, I, th I think this will be of, of growing, growing concern that, um, you know, a number of different remedies may get closed off through plea bargaining. And it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a reason why international human rights recognition may be particularly important in this area, actually, because of, uh, you, 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 other, other, otherwise, uh, you know, anything could be negotiated in a plea unless there's some contrary principle at stake. Other questions? The topic of pre-bargaining is very important, <laughs> obviously. 
um, Mark. So I guess it's a question. It's kind of a question and comment. Um, we talk about precision and you, you look at the existing rules domestically in the US and um, you know revision models. Um, you can find some degree of sort of similarity, not that they're identical from place to place, but it seems like that the, um, the standard of what kind of evidence is required to reopen or revise, um, there, there's some consistency. But what I've found is that um, whenever you start talking to an audience that is unfamiliar with this movement, and most recently I found this in an Ohio task force on wrongful convictions, when we were tasked with coming up with recommendations to change our laws, um, the first hurdle you always face is that people tend to believe that those who were exonerated and freed had 100% evidence of their innocence. Um, and so the first conversation always goes like this, sure, yeah, yeah. When they have 100% evidence of their innocence, nobody, we have, don't have a problem with that. And it's a very difficult to explain to these people that literally never exists um, and, you know, you might have a situation where there was one ID, eyewitness ID and there was forensic science. You've shown that the forensic science was completely fl flawed. There's no reliability whatsoever. And the eyewitness was done in a very imp imprecise manner. And then there's other circumstantial evidence that you combine with that showing that the person's likely innocent. At the same time, the evidence that convicted them is not reliable, but that doesn't 100% prove them innocent. Um, and I have a very hard time getting people over that hump. Um, you know, so I just wondered how that's going to play into it and, and sort of what your recommendation is or thoughts about that. Yeah, that's Mark, that's um that's a good point. I, I wonder, is this something that is um is this a, a new or more recent objection that you didn't get earlier in the innocence movement. I'm just wondering if it's a sort of recent phenomenon or if it's something that's that you found being impediment from the very beginning. No, it's what I'm talking about is, you know, so this is not an issue with the courts. This is not because they understand the rules. This is when you go to somebody new that you want to lobby right. um, like this task force. I just find that the general public has total misconceptions about how the procedures work. Um, and it takes them a long time to understand that you can't prove a negative um, so the default position for anyone you're first introducing this concept to, to is, yes, when there's 100% proof of innocence, X, Y, and Z can happen. Um, and, you know, and, and that seems to be any time. So there's this general, there's this disconnect between the way exonerations work in the legal system, what people who are immersed in that field understand versus what lay people or people you're first introducing this concept to think about the issue. Mm -hmm. So... Uh I forgive now I'm going to manifest my ignorance. I mean, I would think that if you, the examples there that have, that one can point to of uh, situations in which individuals um, can point to whether it's DNA evidence or other types of evidence uh, that are kind of case studies in those, yes, 100% certainty. And then maybe, and again, I'm thinking, I'm sure I'm covering ground that many other people here have already covered and I'm sure would cover it better. But maybe then you can sort of say, okay, well, if you accept that situation, let me actually tell you why that wasn't 100% a done deal when we started looking at it. It turns out at the end of the day that we got to that point. Um, but if that is enough to to sort of whet their appetite, if they say, yes, we don't have anything now, right? And here's, if there's a, a some category of cases in which you would accept that as a principle, that may provide a, a wedge to be able to, to get in there. Now, I, I, I will say that in, in most US states, I would think it would be about expanding the access, right? Not about recognizing it in the first instance. Um, but to the extent that you can say, actually, look at the numbers of people that have been exonerated, found to be factually innocent based on various types of information. Um, and that can start a conversation. 
Um, but I, I hear exactly what you're saying that, um, you know, that that can be um, that that can be an impediment and it has to be handled carefully. I don't think, by the way, your first argument there is, you know, there's an international right to claim innocence. I think your first argument there is let me persuade you with a couple of, you know, uh, key examples, case studies, et cetera, et cetera, um, and uh, build from there. I would just add, Mark, it's not going to affect the pathway to having the right recognized, right? So it's not going to be in terms of, you know, if there is court, if the court decisions are in, you know, a certain way, that's going to be what's going to be influential, like, you know, in that process. But I can imagine where, I can probably imagine, like, one area where it could become a challenge is if you broaden the coalition of people who are working for, on this right, a new right to claim innocence, yeah, you have to do a lot of work to get everyone in that coalition, like on board around what you're actually asking for, right? And so that was something that definitely was an issue, like in the, um, the I know in the right to healthy environment, like the different folks had different because it was such a broad movement, and different had folks different different takes on what the right encompassed. So it won't affect the actual normative pathway piece, but I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it would affect sort of a civil society organizing piece if you broaden the tent, you know, of those um, who are engaged would, would be my sense in, in practice of how that would have an impact. So there is Justin Brooke. Nice to see you, Justin, even, even if only online. <laughs> yeah, good to see everybody early in the morning here in California. Uh, yeah, just following up, Mark said there has, and, and really the question of has this evolved and changed over the years, it really has, because if you look at the first wave of innocence cases, they were all based on DNA. You know, the first couple hundred of DNA exonerations were really set a high bar um, for innocence claims. And now we're kind of in a period of time where we've got all this junk science that's been proven. We've got all these great ways to establish that um, the convictions aren't reliable. And what we've seen in California is we used to have a new evidence standard that said you need evidence that completely undermines the prosecution's case and points unerringly to innocence, which was an incredibly high bar. And we've been able to, through lobbying, to change the new evidence standard and get the legislatures here to understand that that bar it, any judge could basically say, even in a DNA exoneration, well, there's still some evidence of guilt. I mean, a, a witness ID them or anything. They're, they're, the color of their shirt was the same as a witness said it was. Uh, so we, we have been, in some states, able to kind of lower those expectations. But even within our own movement, um, there's been a sort of class system of cases. And just in the past couple of years, we started recognizing at our annual conference, people who'd been paroled, who had claims of innocence, but never were fully exonerated. But we still, by and large, use our standard for innocence of whether the prosecutor's office has decided to recharge or formally dismiss the case. So in some ways, you know, we've let the prosecutors determine which are innocence cases and which aren't. So I think it is a problem that, that Mark brings up of not just sort of an education problem, but even within our movement of this, this class system of what does it mean to be innocent. And I also think the evolution has been because we've moved away from those amazing first round of DNA cases, where we not only often prove the person was innocent, but we found the guilty person. And those are the cases where people are like, oh, okay, I get it. That person's definitely innocent because you found the person who did it. And there's very few cases that fall into that class anymore. I have to say, thank you. That was such a helpful explanation, Justin. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of evolution that gets tracked in like, so the report of the SR on the right to the environment exactly tracked those kinds of evolutions around, you know, what were the early recognitions looking like, you know, what, what, what are the guts of merging? And so I think that context um, is a really important one, like to build into the expectation of what the right should now protect, right? And so that would be the kind of content, again, it can't be US specific, it needs to be transnational, it needs to be global, right? Here are the global trends exemplified by countries X, Y, and Z. But I think saying like, you know, that, that exact, I would imagine in a report of, you know, if you had a report on this question um, to the Human Rights Council by the rapporteur, it would exactly track those evolutions, like as a way of, you know, explaining 
where the new protection needs are emerging too. Because part of the new right claim is to have something that fills a protection gap, right? And so what you're trying to show is that there is a need to address that. And really the standard that we've been pushing is with district attorney's offices, no confidence in the conviction. You know, when they start talking about, well, how are you definitively showing they're innocent? We say, well, how do you possibly have any confidence in the conviction? And some of it started to adopt that language. So I would like to underline that also in Europe, there is an important debate and this moment about the use of the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt in the phase of review of conviction. So it's a problem in, in, in all the world. So uh, we have uh, three minutes for uh, other questions. If uh, there is okay so i believe uh, our time uh, together is up uh, i just want to remind you that the next panel is tomorrow starting at 10 in um, uh, in the morning in New York time uh, and it will be focused on the strategies uh, from uh, other new rights campaigns the zoom link for the session I think it is uh, the same uh, you have used to join us today thanks again to the organizers to Mark Goltze uh, organizer of the meeting for this incredible opportunity have a nice day from Italy I don't want if Mark uh, or or other organizer wants to to say thank you. All right. Thanks to everyone for uh, this. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, see you tomorrow. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.